Providing you with an up-to-date evaluation of the role of surgery in peptic ulcer, this is Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 16, Number 10, for the week of May 28, 1969. During this hour, you'll hear a comprehensive analysis of vagotomy for duodenal ulcer by Andrew W. K. of the University of Glasgow Faculty of Medicine in Glasgow, Scotland, a helpful guide to the surgical management of gastric ulcer by Stanley O. Herr of the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, and a discussion of postoperative complications in gastric surgery by J. Engelbert Dunphy of the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine. Serving as program moderator is the University of California's Albert D. Hall. Duodenal ulcer occurs at some time in about 10% of people. Although the average age of onset is 33 years, the ulcer may occur at any time from infancy to the later years. It's four times as common in males as in females. What are the physiologic effects of vagotomy for duodenal ulcer? Our first speaker, as introduced now by Dr. Hull, provides the answer. This question of the physiologic effects of vagotomy, of course, is something that behooves all of us to be as well informed about as possible. And Dr. K has, over the years, been one of the major contributors to our understanding of this problem and has published widely on the subject. So it's a great privilege for us to have Professor K here to give us the latest information on the physiologic effects of vagotomy. Professor K. In dealing with the surgical treatment of duodenal ulcer, in the last 15 years or so, it's become pretty obvious, I think, to all of us, that vagotomy is playing a part in many of our operations. Vagotomy with drainage, vagotomy with antrectomy, truncal vagotomy, selective vagotomy. And it seemed to me that the time had come for a, a critical appraisal of exactly where vagotomy stands. Now, the very first thing I think we surgeons should know about is what actually happens when we do a vagotomy. And the first factor on vagal influences on gastric secretion are the psychic factors. And this, of course, is abolished. But remember, while psychic factors are very important in dogs, they play a relatively small part in the vagal drive on gastric secretion in men. The second thing we know about if you give an injection of histamine or gastrin, you'll get an acid output. But if the vagus nerves have been divided, the output is greatly reduced. And the point that comes out of this, and it's both animal and human experiment, that there seems to require to be a sort of optimal amount of acid secreting cells before they'll respond completely. Another point that's become increasingly clear, and again, both from experimental and clinical observations, is that the vagus not only drives the parietal cells directly, but by virtue of the innervation of the antrum, it directly has an effect in releasing gastrin. So that's a third way in which the vagus produces acid secretion. Another thing that's pretty clear, if you make a little antral pouch, and this is obviously canine studies, which is innervated, and you infuse the antrum with acetylcholine or food or some other stimulant, you'll get a good acid output from a denervated or Heidenheim pouch. If you then denervate the antrum, this diminishes the release of gastrin and a smaller acid output. So there's a fourth way when we divide in the vagal trunks that we diminish gastric acid secretion. The last one I think is less well known. Dr. Martin Grossman in Los Angeles and his colleagues showed this first of all that if you give an injection of gastrin, acid comes from a Heidenheim pouch. But if at the same time you keep up a gentle distension of this pouch, you will get a greatly augmented acid secretion. And there's good reason to believe if we left a nerve intact coming to that pouch that that would still be further augmented. So there are five ways in which the vagus produces acid secretion. And there's one thing we do when we carry out a vagotomy that is probably undesirable, and this experiment is again a well-known one. The vagus innervates to the duodenum and facilitates the inhibition of acid secretion. And after vagotomy, this particular mechanism of duodenal acid inhibition will be lost with a tendency for acid to rise. And in summary of these physiological studies, these five points are good effects that we can expect when we do a truncal vagotomy. The only physiological defect in the whole basis of the operation is that we might lose the benefit of duodenal acid inhibition. And when we do a complete truncal vagotomy,
and measure maximal acid output, either by augmented histamine test or histolog, as we do nowadays by pentagastrin, we can expect that the maximal acid output will be reduced by 70%. Now, we know that we can reduce the acid output, but clearly it's very important to know, is this a permanent reduction? Because if, in fact, the acid output rises with the passage of time, then the patient is at risk to recurrent ulceration. Now, this is an early study of ours done by Peter Bell. Small numbers, and we've a lot more since, but the message is exactly the same. What we have done is we've taken three small groups of patients, all of whom had complete, according to Holland, their vagotomies, and we did the maximal acid studies. 13 patients had, just before they left hospital, the mean value was a 65% reduction. When restudied one year later, it was a 72% reduction. In other words, unchanged. Small group of six patients studied again two years later, acid reduction maintained. Small group of patients studied three years later, acid reduction maintained. Now, when we spoke about this, in fact, we wrote it up, I suppose, three, four years ago, we, quite rightly, I came to the conclusion that in the evidence we had, that at least up to three years, it looked as if the acid reduction you get from complete vagotomy will stay. Now, it's often a mistake to look at things closely. Recently, in fact, just this year, I got one of the boys to do insulin tests on a group of patients on whom we had insulin tests at 10 days after vagotomy and asked them to repeat it again between one and four years later. We specially selected 25 patients that we knew were completely negative at the time of operation, and nine of these remain Hollander negative, but 16 have become Hollander positive. Seven, we specially chose to study what happened to them that had been incomplete vagotomies, not very surprisingly, they consistently stayed as incomplete vagotomies. Now, really, what we are trying to do as surgeons is to get a good acid reduction and keep it there. So the next thing I asked them to do, and the same patients, was to repeat their maximal acid output studies. And the 61% reduction in this group of patients at 10 days after surgery was still maintained at one to four years later. Now, this is a big question. I don't know the answer to this one, but this is the data at the moment. The insulin test seems to become increasingly positive with the passage of time. And if that's the only test we do, it certainly is going to make us worry. But what we're really interested in is does the acid level stay down? And with the data we have at the moment, it does. But we obviously now are going to study this very carefully. There's a very important question here, and we'll have something more to offer one of these days. Now, in talking about incomplete vagotomy, this raises the subject. I had the temerity one day, this was in Sheffield, just before I left, to go to my secretary and say to her, would you just look out some insulin tests for us? And she got one, two, seven consecutive insulin tests. And I said, don't put down names of surgeons. Just put down, I, I told her the, the surgeon that I would say had done a lot of vagotomies and who should be capable of doing it. And I put down some of the young surgeons in training. They weren't all in my unit. This was throughout a hospital. Now, this is really quite staggering. And I learned a great lesson from it. Now, I don't believe the consultants you chaps and me, are always going to have as good a record as this. But in this particular instance, it came up that way. And you'll see the difference with younger surgeons in training. And I think the lesson I got was that the first 10, maybe 20 vagotomies that a young man does in his training program must be done with a competent person there to ensure as far as possible that this is a complete vagotomy. I never worried when a young surgeon came to me and said, I've done a gastrectomy and showed me the specimen. Even I could see it was a stomach and I knew he had taken it out. <laughs> but if he comes along to me and says, I've taken out some nerves and the path report comes back and there's neural elements in them all, that doesn't mean a thing to me. I'm worried about the nerve that's still lying on the esophagus. This is a more difficult operation in that sense. It's easier to do in some ways, safer, and we're all very happy about it, but I think technically it's a more demanding operation than gastrectomy. Now, the next thing that we must look at in vagotomy is nutritional status, because it's on this basis that B2 gastrectomy was really confounded. We've turned away from it largely, not because of its recurrent ulcer rate, but because of nutritional status. We're looking at it this way, first of all, from the point of view of weight. It's a simple parameter to look at. And we looked at this in 100 consecutive vagotomies with gastrojejunostomy, studied at four years, 
after operation, all at four years. Weight gain is far greater than weight loss. And in fact, those that did lose weight, the great majority of them lost less than five kilograms. Now, at a glance like this, you immediately say, oh, this is a different picture from gastrectomy altogether. And I think, by and large, it is. But that's a crude way to look at weight. And the right way to look at weight is this. We've got to consider the difference between the operation weight and the patient's previous estimated best weight. In other words, did he lose weight before he came to surgery or did he not? Now, if you put that against post vagotomy weight, you'll have the patients who came to surgery having lost a good deal of weight. And you'll see that this group of patients are the ones that gained weight. So that when you really analyze this properly, the picture's not so good. Those that come up without losing weight tend to lose a bit of weight. I still think the picture is marginally better than after polygastrectomy. Now, another nutritional parameter, of course, are mainly the hematological ones, and the same 100 patients looked at four years later. With hemoglobin, there's a small number of abnormal results. But this is exactly what you would expect if you looked at an outpatient population coming up to our clinics. But when you look at serum iron, there's a bigger proportion of abnormal results, and it made us feel that with the passage of time, there might very well be a significant incidence of iron deficiency anemia. The same applies for serum B12, Nothing abnormal of sorts here, but when you do B12 absorption studies, again, there is evidence perhaps with the passage of time, we'll get some megaloblastic anemias in our vagotomy patients. And then there is a very considerable proportion of patients with a raised fetal fat in the stools. Now, the only way, in my view, to compare two operations is to do a randomized, well-controlled trial. I will not accept gastrectomies done between 1950 and 1960, and vagotomies done between 1960 and 1970. The results, I just will not accept the comparison. Now, just before I left Glasgow to go to Sheffield with Sir Charles Illingworth, we had started a randomized trial of this sort, comparing vagotomy with drainage and polygastrectomy. And the plan was, we didn't know which was the better operation, so it was thoroughly moral and ethical. The plan was the surgeon did the exploration, said it is easy and safe for me to do one as the other, and then he was told by random selection of a card which to do. Now, when I came back from Sheffield, we were therefore able to look at this eight years later. The groups were, and this always happens if you do a random trial, you get beautifully matched groups for age, height, weight, and time since operation. Now, just a quick run through. And I'm only going to look at the hematological parameters because a talk on this trial would be a talk on its own. There's a bigger proportion of low values for hemoglobin in the gastrectomy group, and this just reaches significance in favor of vagotomy. When we look at serum iron levels, again, there's a, obviously a bigger proportion of bad results or low serum iron values in the gastrectomy group, but this doesn't statistically reach significance. When we look at the total iron binding capacity and saturation, again, there's just the hint that gastrectomy is worse. And in fact, in this particular case, it does reach significance. Looking at serum vitamin B12, again, the hint is there, but no significance. But again, just a little advantage or a feeling of advantage towards vagotomy. And finally, looking at serum folate, exactly the same, a few lower results with gastrectomy, but no significance. Now, to me, this was a surprise. If anyone had asked me about one year ago what the result of this would be, oh, I would have said this will be strongly in favor of vagotomy. Well, it is in favor, but it's not strongly in favor, and it means that we've just got to think. We've got all these patients carefully documented, and it will be interesting to look at them in another two, five years. Now, coming to the question of vagotomy on bowel habit, it's one of these things which causes a lot of emotion. This is the same 100 consecutive patients I spoke about. And when one of my boys started looking into post-vagotomy diarrhea, he got 49 publications. And in these, 42 of them didn't even define what they meant by diarrhea. So he put these in the waste paper basket. And they finished up with seven that at least had some measurement, like frequency of bowel movements or something of the sort. And he went into this very intensively, and they were at four years, and here are our results. And this, I think, has been borne out by most groups that have looked at it closely. 10%, since we're speaking of 100 patients, these are percentages. 10% had transient diarrhea. Very important, because none of us must write 
papers about post-vagotomy diarrhea until at least a year has elapsed because this is quite a common thing and some of them will clear up in a week or two, some in months, but by the end of the year, this group's out the way. Constipation can occur. And first look at this, of course, really would frighten the daylights out of you. 71 patients had an increased bowel frequency. I'll just mention this one because episodic diarrhea is a thing that we often tend to forget when we're assessing bowel habit. And there's quite a number of patients who do have a day or two in which they have a few loose bowel movements very quickly in the morning and then they clear up and they may be well for days, weeks or months. Most of these are not very troublesome. Now I'm going to put this in the form of a histogram. Five had reduced bowel movement, 24 unchanged, 71 with increased bowel movement. Now 29 of these patients had their bowel frequency increased to one motion a day. 20 were increased to one or two a day and so on. And only eight had three bowel movements or more, and in fact, our percentage of really troublesome ones was four. Now, it depends exactly how you do it, you see. And I know one or two surgeons, I've got colleagues in England, who would call this, and it's true, this is increased bowel frequency compared with preoperatively. But most duty and also patients are constipated. Now, Alan Cox, when he did this, also tried, and you know how vague it is to try and get the patient's own impressions, but he put them down for interest. And this is what he found the 71 with increased bowel habit. 55 of these gave him a shake in the hand and said, we are pleased. <laughs> Six of them were disappointed. But 10 of them, which is highly unusual in the United Kingdom, were indifferent to the entire situation. <laughs> Now, uh, I don't really need to go through the rest. The same sort of uh, idea comes out of them. But uh, really what you can imagine uh, is that uh, these patients are sitting in clinics and talking together and one says, you know, I had terrible constipation, but I had this operation and it's great. And if, if they don't get an improvement in that direction, they feel disappointed. It also shows you that subjective data is really pretty crummy. <laughs> now, the next question I would like to put in front of us is does the type of drainage operation influence the incidence of diarrhea. We have been running the last three, four years a randomized series of total vagotomy in which we add the drainage procedure by random selection. And uh, I took out 200 of them that have been followed for one to two years just before I came to give you some idea of the results. Here is the position at one year, pyloroplasty comes first, gastrogegenostomy next. And when you look at the changes in bowel habit and compare them in the groups, and I can assure you statistically, there is no difference at all between the two as regards the incidence of diarrhea. The next thing which I'll deal with really very quickly is what is the pathogenesis of diarrhea after vagotomy. I'll deal with it quickly because I don't know the answer. <laughs> the things that have been considered, I think this was a very good explanation when Dr. Dragstead did vagotomy without a drainage procedure. I think there was no doubt there was gastric stasis. I think there would be bacterial contamination there and they overflow into the uh, duodenum and this could cause some of the diarrheas. I have no doubt also because I have three or four good examples. When you see a patient with diarrhea after vagotomy who's had a gastrojejunostomy as the drainage procedure, always consider a blind loop syndrome. This can be pretty well proved by putting them on tetracycline and in the three in particular, I'm thinking about conversion to a pyloroplasty was like magic. We mustn't expect to be like magic every time. It'll only work that way if, in fact, there is good reason for it. Now, denervation of the small intestine, we could find no evidence in our clinical studies that this played any part. There are some lovely studies done by Bastable in Westminster on both denervation of the pancreas, denervation of the biliary tract in animals. He was unable to find any of the parameters of rate of secretion, the pressure of secretion, et cetera, et cetera, changed by vagotomy. The drainage procedure we have studied, it doesn't seem to apply, and some would say that when you get steatorrhea, you get diarrhea, and this may in some cases be so. But enough of this, I think the likely thing is, in every individual that gets diarrhea after vagotomy, one or even two or perhaps more of these mechanisms may be acting together, and it's for us to study our patients and try and find out which are the important ones. Now, when one looks at innervation, the vagal innervation, uh, or a central vagal innervation of the alimentary tract, 
any anatomist, any surgeon with any common sense would say, if you can denervate the stomach and preserve the rest, it sounds like a good surgical principle and makes common sense. On the other hand, in our country, this was not why it was introduced. It was introduced because some people said the incidence of diarrhea was 40%. And having said the incidence of diarrhea was 40%, they then said, if you don't denervate anything else but the stomach, you will cure it. Now, this is not scientific thinking. It might have been right, but it's not scientific thinking. The other thing, of course, we have to remember is that a selective egotomy takes a bit longer, and I would wonder if in the hands of surgeons throughout the world it would be so completely done if we were all doing it. Now, what evidence have we? I put this question to Sully Marks and Professor Yanni Lowe in Cape Town about two years ago, and they said they had no idea of the answer to this. No one else had produced data, and it's obviously the fundamental question, because this is why most people are doing it. But they immediately said, well, we've done selective egotomy, and we've done total, we'll get the results out. And in short, they put a little letter in the Lancet within about a month. And here are their results, and all the operations were done by Professor Lowe. Now, they weren't randomized, so it's not perfect, but it's the next best thing. 77 of one, 83 of the other, percentage with diarrhea, transient, I don't think we need to worry about. And then when you come to persistent, there is obviously no difference in the incidence of diarrhea, which is about our figure, in the total or in the selected. Now, trying to get the ideal way of doing it, Dr. Ketterns Kennedy and Alistair Connell in Queens, Belfast, have started a randomized trial of selective against total with the same drainage procedure in every patient. At the moment, as far as I know, there is no good evidence that selective vagotomy will influence the incidence of post-vagotomy diarrhea. I know there'll be people in the audience that say it will, and I would be delighted if they would put up the evidence to persuade me. Now, the next thing, and this is a remarkable thing, Quite a number of people in both our countries were doing selective vagotomy for a long time, and when the question was put to them, is this a complete gastric vagotomy, one couldn't get the answer. And you would have thought that again was a question that had to be answered pretty quickly. Again, I put this one to Sully Marks, and he said, right, we'll give you the answer. And I was only there a weekend before I got the answer. Selective vagotomy, total vagotomy, and we're looking at percentage reduction in the maximal acid output. The figure that we've become accustomed to, 66% reduction of basal and uh, 62 in truncal. In other words, and this is on the side of the selective vagotomies, selective vagotomy can give a good gastric vagotomy. And if I was asked at the moment to guess, if selective vagotomy comes in, I'm sure it'll be on this basis. It might just be that once we're all trained to do it properly, that we'll get a higher incidence of complete vagotomy by the selective method. Now, I don't think this is proved yet, but I would be prepared to think that this might just happen. Here is the Belfast series looking at insulin responses in the two groups, which is a better one than the South African one. They've got two positive Hollanders in the selective group, and they have nine in the truncle, giving just a bit of strength to my hint that I'm dropping. It might be that this is the better way of doing a gastric vagotomy. Another question that many people ask, vagotomy as surgical treatment for perforated duodenal ulcer. Some data which is not my own, it is clear that vagotomy with drainage used, presumably with discrimination, in the management of perforated duodenal ulcer can be done safely. Now, I learned from one of my colleagues working in a small hospital about 40 miles out of Glasgow, a consultant with one registrar, that's a sort of third year, I think he would be resident, working pretty well, doing all the work by themselves, that they were doing this. And I asked him if he would get his results out so that I could see how things were happening. He's done 81 patients, and he's used different drainage procedures according to which he thought was safer. He's done these 81 with his registrar with no mortality, and at follow-up, at this stage, he tells me they're symptom-free. Now, this doesn't worry me so much, but I think this is quite an impressive figure. And to make quite sure that he wasn't dealing with highly selected cases, he's got quite a number in the older age group. The other thing that might have influenced the result is the time since perforation. And while the great majority were within the first six hours, there are quite a number up to 12 and some longer than perhaps I would have considered doing the operation myself. So the answer to this question is that 
vagotomy and drainage can be done with safety, but one really must not do this on every patient. I would just not accept that under any circumstances. The briefest of words, can we use vagotomy for the bleeding ulcer? And I personally have been doing this now for some little time. It has got its defects, and translating that, roughly speaking, means where do we go from here? The first thing I would say is I think we must go from here by doing more carefully controlled studies. You know, every place one goes, and you've all met this, you speak to a surgeon and you say, what do you do for duodenal ulcer? And he says with utter conviction, and I really believe with sincerity, oh, there's only one operation, you must do a Billroth II gastrectomy. And then you go to someone else and you know the answer. They all know what's the right thing to do. But in fact, none of us know. And the only way to sharpen our surgical therapeutic weapons is for us to do trials of this sort and bring out the truth. Because I don't believe there is ever going to be one operation which is ideal in the sense that it will cure all duodenal ulcers and give no sequelae. This is just not on. And my own personal thought, I followed it for about 10 years, but so far my quest has been unsuccessful. I would like to think sometime soon that you and I will be able to study an individual duodenal ulcer patient, do certain studies on him and say, for this patient, we should use this operation. I think this is the surgeon's ideal. Not a single operation, but the ability to select operation and relate it to the individual subject. Excuse me, gentlemen, momentarily. Long enough to say that this doctor is the end of this side of your reel. On side B, Stanley Hurd discusses the surgical management of gastric ulcer, and J. M. Robert Dunphy describes some post-operative complications in gastric surgery. To hear this, simply reverse the two reels, or cassette, on your tape recorder. Continuing an issue on the role of surgery in peptic ulcer, this is Side B, Audio Digest Surgery, Volume 16, Number 10. And here once again is Dr. Albert Hall, our program moderator. Dr. Stanley Herr will present the subject of gastric ulcer, Dr. Herr. Gastric ulcer is not to be confused with duodenal ulcer, with marginal ulcer, with esophageal ulcer. And the papers that lump them all together as peptic ulcer are simply not dealing with the disease the way it should be. I think most of us agree that duodenal ulcer are due to hyperacidity. I don't know what causes gastric ulcer. In some of them, it's antrostasis. In some, it may be a reverse alkaline flow jetting back into the stomach from the duodenum through the pylorus. In others, it's baffling. But at any rate, this is the crux of the matter in treating gastric ulcer medically. The familiar reason, pro and con operation. For the operation, if it's malignant, it's a possible cure for a gastric ulcer. If it's benign, there's a very high incidence of relief of symptoms by the operation. Against the operation, a possible fatality, which still can occur following any procedure involving a knife and an anesthetic and uh, late morbidity, which we've all been thinking about and discussing beyond recurrence of the ulcer, which is quite rare after operations for gastric ulcer. As ammunition for those internists or general practitioner friends of yours who like to hoard gastric ulcers and not release them for an operation, uh, they will often say, particularly if the patient doesn't have much in the way of symptoms, if the symptoms don't demand it, the patient doesn't require an operation if it's a benign ulcer, and if it's a malignant ulcer, the results are so poor for gastric cancer that there's no point operating. A colleague of mine some years ago and I carried out a little study in patients in whom the preoperative diagnosis was ulcer, question of benign, question of malignant, and compared the five-year cures, three to five-year cures in this group, where the preoperative diagnosis had been question malignant, question benign ulcer, versus those in whom the preoperative diagnosis was clearly a gastric malignancy. So that if the ulcer that you're observing, that you're recommending an operation for, should in fact prove to be malignant, your patient stands a much better chance of being cured than if it was clearly malignant preoperatively. We have had surgeons in the United States, Professor Kay, who felt that every gastric ulcer should be operated on almost immediately, except their own. In our institution, we operate on about 40% of patients who have a gastric ulcer. The remainder appear to be controlled well on medical management and don't have the complications of ulcer 
requiring surgery. However, I think it's well for internists and gastroenterologists and family physicians to bear in mind that the radical treatment for a gastric ulcer is medical treatment, and the safe treatment is surgical treatment. And there are certain criteria which should be followed for treating a gastric ulcer medically. Of course, uh, there should be free acid on histamine stimulation if the presumption is that the ulcer is benign. Dr. Dunphy and I will recall one patient who had persistent anacidity for many years and a recurrent gastric ulcer where the gastric ulcer was benign, and I've seen several others. But the presumption has to be, if there is anacidity, that the ulcer is malignant. Now, this is a very important item. Sometimes surgery should be undertaken for a gastric ulcer because you're dealing with a patient who doesn't understand the issues. It might be a migratory worker. You're going to lose him. You're not going to be able to keep track and see whether treatment is actually going to cure the ulcer. One of the surgeons in this country who felt that every ulcer should be operated on, gastric ulcer, at once, answered as follows when I spoke with him after a talk at our institution. I said, well, now, supposing you had a little lesser curvature gastric ulcer, symptom has just been going back a few weeks, x-ray shows it to be present, everybody thinks it's a benign ulcer, uh, would you get operated on right away? He said, no. He said, I think I'd probably wait a few weeks and see if it wouldn't heal up. He said, but my dear fellow, in order to make a point, you must overshoot the mark. Well, I think the mark has been overshot in gastric ulcer, and we can now relax and feel that uh, some of them perhaps are the legitimate sphere for the physician rather than the surgeon underscoring the difficulty in differentiating by various modes benign and malignant ulcers. Often it takes multiple sections through an ulcer to be sure that it's benign. I think cytology has been a big help to us if you have a good cytologic pathologists in determining with an exfoliating open lesion whether cancer cells are present. And it may be a good deal more helpful in reaching these determinations than a biopsy. I was brought up on gastric resection as the standard operation for a gastric ulcer. And it should be the standard operation. You should always have the ulcer checked by the pathologist, by a frozen section if possible. If it is malignant, sections can be made at the edge of the cut specimen to be sure that you've cleared enough. And if you haven't, you can go back and take more. Then you can decide what kind of a reconstruction you're going to do. Now, having stated that that's the standard operation, starting on the West Coast, I believe, with Dr. Ferris, at least he was one of the first to promote it, the idea was initiated that maybe it didn't have to be done for every patient who had a gastric ulcer. It's been known for many years that a gastroenterostomy will cure some patients who have a benign gastric ulcer. And uh, Professor Kay, we have added a vagotomy for absolutely no scientific reason of any sort to a biopsy of the ulcer and a drainage procedure under certain circumstances. I got started on it with a very thin patient weighing 85 or 90 pounds who'd lost half of her small intestine from regional enteritis who had a gastric ulcer and it seemed it, it might be a good idea to preserve her stomach if it were possible. That's one of the situations in which it might be appropriate to do a conservative operation. Let's have a show of hands of how many surgeons in this room have left the ulcer in very high ulcers and done a resection below it, or a gastroenterostomy below. Quite a substantial number. Because the alternatives aren't very good, either a proximal esophagogastrectomy, which carries a lot of morbidity, or I, I dare say that some of us have known of instances where an ambitious younger colleague has done a total gastrectomy for such a high ulcer, which proved to be benign. And this may even result fatally. A conservative operation might be useful in acute perforation and possibly in hemorrhage. Some years ago, Dr. Carl Lischer pointed out that giant ulcers, far from usually being malignant, as I was taught when in medical school, are usually benign. And it's possible to do a conservative operation even with a giant ulcer. Now, to do a conservative operation, you must start convinced that the ulcer is benign because it would be tragic indeed to do something less than curative if you happen to guess wrong. Hence, the ulcer should be benign by the usual criteria. It should be grossly benign in the operating room, and it should be benign as far as the pathologist can tell you, 
and you should be willing to take your pride in your hands and if permanent sections a few days later tell you that you, you and the pathologist have made a mistake, you should be prepared to operate again and do a better operation. Now actually the conservative operations for gastric ulcer are really awkward in some circumstances and more difficult than a simple straightforward two-thirds gastrectomy. But if it's in the interest of long-term better result for the patient, we should be willing to put up with a little awkwardness in the operating room and forego the aesthetic pleasure of a nicer procedure for a messier one and spare the stomach. The best thing, of course, is to take out the entire ulcer. You can reach with biopsy forceps and biopsy an ulcer through a gastrotomy. You can take a swab of an ulcer, and if you've got the cooperative pathology department, you can get an immediate reading of the cytology. If the ulcer is conveniently located, then you can do a four-quadrant biopsy, if you wish, together with a swabbing, or just biopsy it in one place if it's almost certainly due to the same type of condition which produces a duodenal ulcer, but is technically on the gastric side of the pylorus, and hence a prepyloric or gastric ulcer. And finally, with a giant ulcer, you should resist the effort to do a block resection with the pancreas underneath it, which is going to be quite difficult and maybe even fatal. And usually you can strip the stomach free of the ulcer bed with the greatest of ease, close the stomach if it's too awkward to turn the stomach over, which it shouldn't be. You can close the stomach through an anterior gastrotomy and then close the uh, gastrotomy afterwards in uh, carrying out your procedure. I've known younger surgeons who were very concerned as to what would happen to the ulcer bed. And uh, although this isn't my topic, I have known of lives that were lost in duodenal ulcers, where it was felt by the younger surgeon that exteriorized ulcer base somehow had to be removed because it represented a continuing threat. This, of course, will heal. It's just fibrous tissue, and adhesions will form against it, and so on. Now we'll hear from Dr. Dunphy on the subject of complications in gastric surgery. Dunphy? Leakage of the duodenal stump obviously still remains the bait noir of Bilroth II resection, but I think it's becoming, in good hands, less common. I've always felt that serious breakdowns of the duodenal stump related to two factors, either gross mismanagement at the time with involvement of the pancreas so that you've got an element of pancreatitis and disruption of the stump or obstruction of the afferent loop with a buildup of juices and breakdown and leakage. I think rarely and very rarely when one is doing a Billroth II with difficulty, catheter drainage of the duodenal stump as recommended by Claude Welsh in Boston is a reasonable thing to do. I've only done it once in my life. I don't think it's very often necessary. Unfortunate results from pancreatitis, and I agree that we don't know why patients develop postoperative pancreatitis. This is a condition that's much higher after gastric and biliary surgery. The incidence is higher, but we don't really know the mechanism. Now, we like to say it was trauma to the pancreas and devascularization of the pancreas, and I could have brought some slides and showed you a very interesting example of a patient who had a Bilroth II gastrectomy by a very competent surgeon who closed the duodenal stump in four layers, turning it in and turning it in, so he had an absolutely beautiful closure. And the patient developed severe postoperative pancreatitis. Actually, this was in the early days of the artificial kidney, and renal shutdown was a manifestation, so he was sent to us in Boston at the time at the Brigham Hospital. And there wasn't very much one could do. What we did learn was that renal dialysis for that sort of thing played no role in reversing the process. And at post-mortem, because of our interest at the time in post-operative pancreatitis, we could show that he had an abnormal vasculature to the duodenum and pancreas. And in turning in this stump, he had ligated what's sometimes referred to as the artery of Wilkie, which is a sizable artery running down behind the pancreas and in this sense, he had produced some potential ischemia. And I think that this is a threat in rare cases when one is doing a coker maneuver as a part of gastric and duodenal surgery. But the other point about postoperative pancreatitis is that it occurs after appendectomy. 
Uh, this occurred after a thyroidectomy, and seen after compound fractures, so that there are some other agent or factors going on here, a combination of, I think, perhaps some dehydration, increased viscosity of pancreatic secretion, and then some stimulus to pancreatic secretion, and this is what we don't know. Maybe it's central. We don't know what it is that sets this sequence in motion. You all know that you can get acute pancreatitis simply from eating a heavy meal, particularly after a period of starvation. This was well documented some years ago at the Carnegie Research Laboratories at Harvard where they were fasting individuals to study the effects of the deprivation of food for a week or two. Some of these boys, after their period of starvation with nothing but liquids, when it was through, they went out and just simply had one big meal and came down with severe pancreatitis, sufficient to require hospitalization. And of course, we all know this is true in the patients with alcoholic pancreatitis, which is triggered so characteristically by food after a period of no food plus alcohol. But I don't know what causes post-op pancreatitis, and I don't know how to treat it. It's very common. Fortunately, Necrotizing, hemorrhagic pancreatitis is comparatively rare, but if you do amylasis after major abdominal operations, you'll find it high very often. Well, I am going to describe one complication of gastric surgery, which I've had an interesting experience with. I saw my first case when I was an intern. This patient had a gastroenterostomy by a very good surgeon the Peter Brigham Hospital, Dr. Francis Newton, a gentle, perfect Halsteadian surgeon. But after the gastroenterostomy, the patient didn't empty his stomach at all. And this is before the days of a lot of gastric suction. He wasn't put on continuous suction so that there was a period of dilatation of his stomach without any question. But then he never was, if I remember correctly, put on continuous aspiration. He had repeated intermittent. This is before Owen Wankenstein suggested that we make it continuous. But no matter what was done, he vomited repeatedly. And finally, Dr. Newton reoperated upon him and found that the opening was very large, no evidence of obstruction. So he closed, and the man still didn't empty and uh, vomited. We didn't give intravenous fluids in those days. He got clases and rectal taps, losing weight, and it finally became desperate. And uh, I think that he operated a third time, if I remember correctly, and redid the anastomosis, which is, of course, the worst thing of all to do for this condition, because he didn't empty after that. Finally, Cachectic, dehydrated, and semi-moribund, he was told he had reached the end of the rope. Well, he said, if I'm going to die, I'd like to die at home. So they let the poor chap go home. And he got home, and he vomited, and, and vomited. And he said to his wife one night, you know, I, I'm, I'm so damn hungry. And, and I, I know they told me not to eat anything, but he said, just before I die, I think I'll have a meal. So, believe it or not, he writes to well, what would you like? And he said, I'd like, I'd like one of those big bowls of Boston baked beans. So, after one more horrendous heave, he ate a bowl of baked beans. And he didn't vomit. The next day, he vomited a little bit, but not as much. So he had some more baked beans. Make a long story short, he cured himself. Now, this, this is an absolutely true story. And I've seen many similar cases. There's a wonderful surgeon in Seattle. Well, he called me one time because he knew of my interest in this and told me that he'd had a patient that he'd been following for almost a year because of failure of gastric emptying. And he had operated on her several times. Uh, they had done a fantastic job of maintaining her nutrition. I think she'd had a feeding jade genostomy. But she had a gastric output, oh, it'd be two or 3,000 cc. And he asked me, 
I'd seen anything of this sort. He begged you heard me talk about it somewhere. And I said, sure. All you have to do is feed her. Feed her. Empty the stomach and start feeding. And that's all you need to do. Well, it took him a little while to get the courage to do it, but this is the answer. Now, we see this fairly commonly today. The vagotomy adds another component, you see, to a little loss of gastric motility. And then my friend Zollinger wrote a paper once in which he said, you know, if you make the gastric opening very small, the stomach will act as a little better reservoir and it won't empty so fast and the patients will be better. Well, he's a pretty shrewd surgeon and he's a very good technician and he doesn't get much edema around his anastomosis, so he could make it fairly small and get away with it. But when every jerk in the country started to do it, they produced the syndrome that I'm describing. Now what happens is that the patient is put on nasogastric suction, which unfortunately in the hands of far too many people has continued for long periods of time, you know, ridiculous periods of time. Two days, three days, four days, five days. There's just no reason for that. If you keep it there, get it just right, maintain perfect suction, you can gradually keep increasing gastric output. This is just like tapping the extra cellular space. And you can make a normal person sick this way. I know this because another great surgical colleague of mine, Dr. Francis Moore, who I was studying the metabolic response to operation. And he had a sham operation, which he brought the boys in. To your surprise, some of them, if you got the tube just right, began to put out quite a lot of gastric juice. So first thing that you do, you see, you put the tube down, and he's got a little edema in his stomach, doesn't empty perhaps too well. You get it just right, and you get his output up to three liters a day or so. And then you see it looks like it's dropping, he looks a little better, you pull the tube, and he doesn't empty very well, and he gets dilated. You put the tube back, and he's back up to 2,000, 3,000. Do it right, and I can get him up to 4,000. Then the question is, how long do you keep this up? Well, as I said, we've had patients sent to us, at least a half a dozen or so in the last couple of years, because they kept it up for a week or two. But it gets spastic, you see. Well, here's the syndrome of post-operative gastric ileus. High output suction. Now, if you do an x-ray, you get an enormously dilated stomach, and it doesn't empty. And everybody gets panicky, so they suck out the barium and quit. And the x-ray man says he's totally obstructed. But if you actually look at it, or get a film a little bit later, you'll see that he's not. There's a little barium that's passed over. He's got a little downstream function, even though it's low. Now, we've got to eliminate the causes, you see, inflammatory causes. You've got to be sure he hasn't got a low-grade post-op pancreatitis, or that he hasn't got an abscess or something of this sort. But it's pretty easy because the other feature of the syndrome is the patients are hungry. They're not sick. They're just like my dying Boston friend. He's, he was dying of starvation and he was getting the wrong kind of treatment. Now, you see what happens is you've got a fair amount of output, you suck him dry, and then you give him fluids. And it's the fluid that his stomach doesn't recognize. At best, if you even get around to feeding him, you're apt to write soft solids. And this represents a concoction prepared in a kitchen, which even when it's trying to make something palatable, doesn't do a good job. But when you ask for soft solids, they make something that no human being would, uh, <laughs> would be caught eating. So you've got a patient who's got this trouble, and then you bring in this nauseating soft solid concoction, and he swallows it, and it sits on top of what fluid he's got, and he's in trouble. So the proper treatment is empty the stomach, put him on suction if he's dilated, and get him decompressed for a day or two, and then take the tube out completely, because he doesn't like the tube, and the stomach doesn't like the tube. I haven't really enforced this rule, but I'm thinking of it. I'd like to have the house officers put a catheter in their bladder, their own bladder,
at the same time that they put the nasogastric tube. <laughs> and then take out their own catheter, you know, just as soon as the nasogastric tube came out. You know, it would be the most skillful management of post-op gastric ileus. You wouldn't see a nasogastric tube on our service anywhere <laughs> after the first hour. <laughs> They'd be very good at it, little intermittent aspiration. I want to emphasize this, though. I'm not saying that patients don't get distended. I don't say that there aren't patients who need to have gastric decompression. But we know from the days before we ever put nasogastric tubes in and kept them that the majority of patients after gastric surgery do not require any post-op suction whatsoever. And if you ignore that, if that is to say, if you don't put a tube in, a few will develop severe gastric distension. And of course that can be a major crisis. So that if you don't put a tube in at all, you do have to follow the patients very carefully and aspirate them. I think intermittent aspiration, the second day, fourth day, is a perfectly good thing to do. Patients don't like it. And oddly enough, sometimes they'd prefer to leave a tube down, they'll tell you, rather than have it taken out and have to have it put down again. But it's much better therapy. Well, then remove the tube and then bring in the nicest looking nurse on the floor with a good looking tray. And the food should be what he wants. Boston baked beans, anything. Doesn't make a bit of difference. He won't ask for a steak, but if he does, say, well, we'll make it, make it a hamburger, grind it up just a little bit. But give him a small amount of solid, palatable food. And that will set the proper things in motion. He's had his vagus cut, he's got some intrinsic motility, which in some way this material is recognized by the stomach in a way that just food is not. And he'll start to function. Four or six hours later, you have to aspirate him. He may have a residual, it's okay, just take it out. Feed him again. And over the next two to three, four days, five days, takes a little time, they'll all straighten right out without any difficulty. And if they don't, it's because they are, in fact, obstructed somewhere, maybe downstream. We've seen this once or twice, where there was an obstruction, say, in a Bill Roth one uh, resection, there actually was an obstruction in the high jejunum, which had not been appreciated. That's a different entity. I suppose that we've seen in the past couple of years, uh, four years, I would say uh, maybe a dozen patients sent to us with this interesting syndrome, which I call post-operative nasogastric tube-induced poor management gastric ileus. We're glad to take your cases if you don't dare feed them. Uh, a couple of these have been personal cases. The patient was sent down to me to be operated upon and have another procedure done. He'd already had two operations by a good surgeon I simply put him on this regimen and sent Blue Shield a consultation fee for $100. They wrote and told me I'd overcharge, so I don't know. Thank you, gentlemen. And those remarks bring to a close this edition of Audio Digest Surgery, produced twice each month by the Audio Digest Foundation, a nonprofit subsidiary of the California Medical Association. All rights are reserved. <laughs>